for the second half of Grove Somerville. And we are starting off with a bang in the, we'll call it the third quarter. We are at the making and manufacturing panel with Jess, Ben, and Dana from Artisans Asylum, Aeronaut, and Bantam Cider. So could you guys give a brief description of your businesses and your role within the companies? The, the emphasis was on brief, I heard that. So I can be really brief. So my name is Dana Masterpolo. Uh, Bantam Cider is uh, the business that I co-own with Michelle De Silva, who couldn't be here today. And uh, as far as role, I, you know, we're a small enough business that I kind of do many things, we all do, but I think uh, CEO um, is probably most appropriate given kind of I handle less the operations uh, and more of kind of the running the business aspect. I'm Ben. It's a good microphone, Chaz. <laughs> I'm Ben from Aeronaut, which is a couple blocks away in Union Square, more by Market Basket. Uh, we're a brewery, a community space, and a manufacturing incubator supporting some small businesses, including a restaurant, a coffee roaster, um, and a couple of chocolate makers. Hi, I'm Jess, and I'm the member services manager at Artisans Asylum. We're actually lucky to be neighbors to Aeronaut, and we're a community workshop or a makerspace, and we're dedicated to the learning, teaching, and practice of fabrication. Awesome. Um, I love how everyone already, it's definitely a community of, uh, everyone knows each other very well already and supporting one another. Um, so Jess, I guess you have a makerspace, so it does help um, aspiring makers to get off the ground, not build this big, huge facility. Um, so I'm curious, Ben, Dana, a little more directed at you guys. How did you test the initial concept before going and building this very big, elaborate, expensive factory or brewery? Um, how, do you, how do you test the concept? Based on the way we did this, I should speak first. No, because I was going to say, I think we've taken the maybe different approaches, but our approach, uh, we started five years ago, uh, it w and this was actually uh, uh, an approach that was forced upon us by an uh, old professor of mine. I went to him with this really novel idea as we were building out this massive business plan of what we should do. We thought we had this great idea. We would start a cider company. There was really nothing on the market at the same time except for big brands, and you know, he basically immediately pointed out what you're doing is not remotely novel, and rather than go through all the effort of doing this massive business plan and you know, doing X, Y, and Z to kind of take over the world initially, he said, just get out and make the product. And so what we did was just that. We kind of were a little deflated, but we literally made some small batches and then the, some bigger batches without really investing too much at all in equipment and we got our product out to the market doing all of our self distributing and so forth and ultimately picked up momentum in that way and then had some market uh, approval which then led to kind of the next step for us yeah we we did do it a little differently can people <laughs> hear me without the microphone just wondering Esther can you hear me more for the camera okay cool um, we did it a little differently. Aeronaut began uh, fully, what's the word? A live birth. <laughs> 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 Running. Uh, we, we started in a 12,000 square foot facility, which we grew into out of our backyard. And uh, we hadn't sold a single beer uh, before we did it in the space which would, which would be our home for the next couple of years to this day. Um, I think we didn't have any knowledge of whether or not it would work in the marketplace or necessarily much of a plan for even how we would build out our space. But a lot of that came from the way people actually used it, which in a lot of ways is kind of related to the story, one of the founding stories of Jess's project. Uh, because Guy, your guy, tells the story of kind of setting forth an open space and telling people to fill it with their own projects and dreams and then seeing that come to pass. So maybe that, in some ways that was more our thing, less uh, of a planned approach, more of a um, let it be as it will approach. Yeah, I think one thing, so we're now 40,000 square feet and we weren't always that size, we're only six years old and originally Guy, the founder, uh, started this in his live workspace, 1,000 square feet, and I think the sort of testing, you know, the concept of sharing tools and sharing resources to make things, he uh, sent out 
uh, a meeting invite and 100 people showed up, so that sort of gave him a sense of what the scale could potentially be. Um, and I think another big part of our beginnings was reaching out to spaces that already existed, smaller spaces like Willoughby and Baltic. And there are people here actually from those beginnings, uh, Willoughby and Baltic, and then other community groups that were actually operating in basements and sort of inviting them to come in on a bigger idea. And I think not being afraid to sort of share that at the beginning and uh, was part of the success that led us to where we are now. Cool. Um, you know, these bit, you have 12,000 square feet, 40,000 square feet. Dana, how, how big is the Bantam we facility? Have, we have 6,000, which might sound small, but we're only manufacturing for wholesale. So we're, we don't have anybody else in our space. Right. But we are currently, I think this is the next date, we are way overgrown. So we're, we're looking right now for more space. If anybody happens to have a spare, sorry. If anybody happens to have a spare 20,000 feet in Somerville, <laughs> we'd love to talk. But so we're, uh, we're looking right now for more space. Okay. Yeah, so How, we're, we're um, all over ourselves. Bobby earlier was talking about permit, you know, permits on permits on permits. Uh, how did you go through permitting, zoning, insurance, uh, all these not the most exciting things in the world? Um, some advisors, some consultants? You know, we didn't. We, I mean, ultimately we took whomever was willing to help along with, with us and asked lots of questions, but we... Uh, you know, we just took every resource we could and we read it and then we called everybody we knew and we asked questions and we, you know, flooded every agency that we had to deal with with questions and we just worked through it and we're, we're thorough and it's a lot of, you know, it was a lot of brute force. We could do it a lot quicker now that we know, um, but there really wasn't an easy resource that we knew of at the time to go to. Um, and we had to deal with, as probably Ben did, we had to deal with the TTB and the ABCC and all these other acronyms, which are the legal bodies uh, which regulate the alcohol production and wholesaling and retailing and so forth. So it was kind of cumbersome, but you know, once you're in it and you're committed, you just figure it out. And so we did that. I mean, now we have more resources. We have more of an understanding of what's involved. We might do it a little differently. I might advise somebody to do it a little differently, but there is no easy way either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would give the same, very similar answer. I know our, our pouring licenses were the first and the second in Somerville. Right. And so that was like, with the pouring licenses, the thing that allows you to sell the, the full pints on site. And those were like very interesting for all parties. I remember we got to work with a lot of folks in regulatory bodies that didn't, didn't necessarily know what the documents were supposed to look like. And um, some, some of which were written up, like the city has to do certain parts of these applications. And so some of these documents were written up for Bantam and written you're, up you're for. Bringing, he's bringing me back to, I'm sorry. <laughs> he's bringing me back to a reality that I've totally, I think I must have blacked it out because it's actually not a fun process. <laughs> which as we were doing the pouring permit in Somerville, it was something that hadn't been created. And so I, we were in some sort of meeting because there are a lot of meetings and the question came up of price and just somebody in the crowd who was an administrator said, well, it should be $3,500. And you know, that's a lot of money for this one annual permit. And I just kind of paused on it, whatever. And I went back and I did a little bit of research and I looked at Boston and Everett and all these other cities. And that was $2,000 more than any other city. And so we just politely went back and said, is there any chance we could look at this again? Because it seems like this would be a more appropriate amount. And, and they ultimately did. And so I think the point is, to your point, they'd never done some of these things before. And so just, you know, you had to stay on top of it to, they didn't have the forms, you're right. They didn't. We submitted weird forms and they kind of had to do workarounds and so forth. So it might be a tad bit easier for the next 10 breweries that come into town. Yeah. Well, cool. you're, you're innovating both on the business side, but also on a policy, and you know, pu zoning. public, pu yeah. yeah. Zoning was, zoning's been fun. Yeah. My, attor our, um, you know, our, our attorney was an alderman before he worked for Aeronaut, and he wrote a lot of, him with the city council, the, the city councilor, I guess it's called, the attorney that works for the city, they wrote some of the documents that we wound up having to, mm -hmm potentially even once because we were literally in the process at basically the same time right, right. and likely you know there was crosstalk even there it was long long it required a lot of I felt like we did actually a lot of pretty extensive research beforehand even though some some people would would say we probably hadn't done enough <laughs> <laughs>
we'd done more than that person had done, certainly, though. So. Jess, you're um, being a member of services and really interfacing with the Artisans Asylum community. How much of it is educating people coming in on what they can do and can't do at a, at a place like this? Uh, I often uh, joke that we, we don't keep the list of things that people have asked us to do <laughs> if they can do it and that we say no to, um, just so there's no documentation and record of all the crazy ideas. Um, so I think for us, um, just keeping track uh, and documenting and educating all the members that come in, we have about 400 people um, who regularly come in and use the space and um, really just signage and documentation and being uh, having some humility when talking to the fire marshal about is this something that we can do maybe theoretically if maybe someone had that idea um, is a good has been good for us just to get some feedback because they're actually been very helpful in saying oh well if that was actually happening here's the steps you need to take um, so having a good relationship with the fire marshal especially has been really important for us um, and as we grow and as we um, you know we have 160 studio spaces so all of these sort of little uh, which was once empty now is full of lots of flammable things um, so that has been helpful for us. But I think, I mean, no, um, it's rare for people to know even what a makerspace is. Oftentimes when you're interfacing um, with the fire marshal and inspectional services and um, getting permits and uh, in particular insurance. Um, so I think it's been important for us to document and do a lot of the work that it sounds like you've done to help people behind us do this in their city or if they wanted to open up another makerspace in Somerville or Cambridge or wherever, so. Mm -hmm. So once all the permitting and everything is taken care of, which isn't a sh short or easy process, um, how important and motivating is it for, for all of you to help foster a, a culture of making and small batch brewing, um, just cr more creation and um, putting, making things, uh, you know, in Somerville, and just being part of that, part of that community of, of making. You're looking at me first. I think um, for us having, trying to have open houses, and we actually give tours every single day, uh, and our members volunteer to, to do that and share their work has been really important. So having those sort of open events, low barrier to entry, people can just come and check it out um, has been important for us to be involved. And um, it's always hard. There's always so much happening. So communicating that back to people um, can be a challenge, keeping up with newsletters and social media and press and all of this stuff. You know, we're a staff of four, um, so we're really just, you know, trying to keep everything um, running, but... Um, 10,000 square feet per person. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, leveraging existing events, so Somerville Open Studios is an incredible opportunity for us to open our doors and invite the public in. Um, you know, we oftentimes will, you know, partner with Aeronaut and say, come to Aeronaut and watch BattleBots. You know, our members made some of those and um, you know you can come actually look at that. Um, so that's been and those are that's just so easy. It's just been like a pleasure to reach out to folks like you to you do that, that kind of stuff. No, I didn't actually. I'm behind, so no spoilers. But it's so good. You should watch the show. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Last night there were like seventy screaming. It was crazy. Have you been to, you've been to the, it's always like that, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah, it's like really, yeah. 70 or so screaming people. There, but Alexandra's been there. Wow, I mean, like yelling and wailing and hooting, it was really fun. I saw it for the first time. Um, but we have, so to the question, we, um, Aeronaut's built to, built for flexibility and built for testing. Um, we split our company down the middle to an extent, our manufacturing business. We have Aeronaut Labs, which is a, um, a 
an independent brewing and yeast cultivation organization. And then we have Aeronaut Brewery, which makes most of the beer that people drink in the tap room. As different staffs, they work together all the time. We have a founder that runs the brewery, that, that runs the labs. And then we have a, basically a different founder that is, is operational chief of the brewery. They talk and they work together and they, they function as quality control and all these things. But basically we make are sure. You, do you fill one of those roles or you're no, overseeing? No, I, I work at a different, a different place in the company. I work on special projects. Okay. So actually my role as a CEO, which is an interesting part of this company, is, is that I, I, um, I tend to work on a different department for a period of about 30 to 60 days, and then I move on. Because what we found is that it can be hard to write documents the first time. It can be hard to build training programs. It can be hard to create uh, places where the brewers and the public have to interface or where we train tour guides. Um, train bartenders, create web systems and, and tools to broadcast what's in the tanks onto what's on the internet. And so I usually work on something for 30 or so days mm. with a team of two or three people. And then they're expected to continue the thing that we either started or targeted fixing together. Um, and so sometimes those journeys take me into the lab, sometimes into, uh, into the brewery, and sometimes into other reaches, which has been a lot of fun trouble a lot of trouble well the other it's it's working you know you you were in alston right now for the summer and dana and, and bantam are involved in that that's a collaboration with bobby and compliments as well um and uh, oops, no please i forgot i forgot what i was going to say you, you can do that in a minute and I don't think Jess knows, or maybe you do, but when we built out our space, we went to the Artist Asylum to try to find some people that could help us, and we did get some help with our metal tables. We have welded steel tables, and also we work with somebody currently, Sal, who does all of our tap handles. So, uh, so for us, our, our model might be a little bit different than uh, of you guys, uh, we we were set up to be a production hard cider company. So we are really focused on selling our product to the wholesale market. So through package stores, liquor stores, bars, restaurants, etc. And we're distributed in uh, in seven states right now. So the tap room though has been a real integral part for us in doing what we're talking about which is the small batch work which is really huge because it allows a feedback loop for us to understand if we're thinking of this product that has got these interesting flavor profiles you know is it just something that we in our little lab think is cool or is it really something that people are interested in in purchasing and trying and so we get some uh, great feedback on some of our potentially one-off products that might ultimately end up being the next product that we have year-round. And so that's really how we use our, our interaction with the public and, and our storefront in Somerville. And it just so happens that my partner, Michelle, literally grew up across the streets for until she was 10 years old from our space on mm -hmm. Miriam. And, you know, the same landlord is there, and they're Portuguese, and they're all in the Azores at one part, and they all used to work at the White Rose Baking Company, which is where our building currently sits, and that we live in Union Square. So it's a tight-knit group anyway, like our street, our neighbors, um, what we do as a, as a business. We're almost all of our employees live in Somerville currently until it got too expensive and then moved to Medford. But they all, you know, we're all kind of in the, in the community, and that's a really nice thing for us. Um, because that keeps us feeling really grounded. What um, what's what's next in the short term for each company, and maybe a little little further out the long term? What's on the kind of pie I'll in the just, sky? What's the yeah, big? Yeah, so big I alluded to a short time ago that we're uh, we're kind of all over ourselves in our in our space. We're planning to keep the space as our retail face and doing our smaller smaller test batches, but we're looking for a bigger space and significantly bigger so that we can, can continue to grow the business. And for us, that's an immediate term thing. It's just not happening as immediately as we would like it to happen. And beyond that, I mean, we're, we're always doing great things, like whenever we're invited. So excited to partner with these guys in Alston. Alston, Brighton, Alston. 
I'll, okay, no, I, I just don't. Yeah, I just don't know. Where, okay, same thing. Um, I just didn't know exactly where the line was. But, and uh, we're doing, you know, we do cider dinners or or different pairings, whether it's with Journeyman, whether it's stuff with Back Bar, whether it's, you know, uh, we're, we're we've got a really great uh, footing in Somerville, in Boston, in Greater Boston, and so for us, that's not something we want to lose uh, lose. Uh, connectivity with you know it's really important to us and we will always prefer to try to work with the artist asylums and the, the local craftsmen to do our stuff we could easily go out and mass produce tap handles that look kind of like what we're doing but you know for us it's a nicer feeling to try to do it locally because it's more um, it's the reason we started the business we wanted to actually know who we got our products from and feel connected to what we were doing Next steps? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's been an exciting summer. You're going to have more chips af after this. More what's now? It seemed like you liked the chips. Yeah, I'll have so some more in chips. In the next half hour, you're going to have some more chips. Next what about steps after that? will be towards the chips. Right. And in the long term, uh, we don't really know. You know, Aeronaut is, uh, is a change, rapidly changing company. We're experimenting with new, new locations, new venues, new products, and um, Aeronaut Labs. There might be an Aeronaut Labs brew pub venue coming someday, which would be cool. That'd be exciting. Well, but the la you're, it seems like a very experimental model. So it seems like you're, you just put out kind of prototypes or test stuff out and see what, yeah, we're see what pushing works. a, um, we've been getting into these conversations with the scientists that we, that we said goodbye to a couple of years ago. And we're trying to wrap a different kind of education and new kinds of like, how do I say it? You know how people drink a lot of kombucha these days or talk about artisanal lacto pickles and, and, and there's some, uh, some science under that. There's like a lot of science in the food you eat, food science, molecular gastronomy. Um, so we're, we're experimenting with a laboratory approach to making and marketing beer, which is, which is new. We compete with a lot of breweries that that um, the scientists and the brewers know a lot about science, but the marketing people don't know diddly. And so we're kind of building a cohesive, um, a beer communication project called Aeronaut Labs, which will be making interesting, micro microbially interesting beers, which should be very exciting for people. I hope, I think it'll be cool. Yeah, like a little farm. We can't farm wheat or hops all that well in Somerville. Yeah, I like it. It's going to be cool. Jess, you guys are looking for more space, right? 40,000 square feet, I heard, is, is not enough for your community. We're actually not necessarily looking for more space. We did, A different space. We did just sign our five-year extension, so we'll be here for the next five years. What happens after those five years uh, is... You know, I think we need to own a building to really be able to become an institution and be able to provide our services um, for very little or for free. I mean, if we could teach people for free how to do this and provide them the tools, you know, that would be the dream. Um, and rent is actually our uh, just number one expense. And as Somerville has grown and changed, I mean, five years ago, um, when we came into the then uh, almost empty Ames business complex. Um, it's now this thriving hub of uh, small, large businesses um, and so many people. So our rent has you know tripled, quadrupled from that original uh, lease. So uh, it's a lot for us to handle and we can't really pass those costs along to our members who are artists and makers and really can't necessarily afford um, our prices if they go up again. So that's our sort of long term, you know, we need to be able to find um, something um, to deal with those issues. And we actually put a bid in for the Powderhouse School mm -hmm. um, that came up. So we weren't selected for that, but it was a great process for us to figure out what we needed. Um, we actually had a Trinity financial uh, a development partner willing to build a new giant cool building for us. So. We think it's possible, um, so that's um, sort of feels 
long term, but it is pretty near term. Five years is not that long um, for us to be able to find a space that would meet our needs. Uh, but short term, our sort of new uh, programs that we're doing, we just launched an international makerspace exchange program with Makerspace Thailand. So that, uh, starting in December, we'll send one of our members to Thailand for a month to learn and share a uh, technique or craft that's uh, special to them, and then we'll host a maker from Makerspace Thailand in the spring uh, during Somerville Open Studios, and they'll be teaching uh, something unique to them, to our community. So we're really excited about that happening, uh, and we're going to expand that as we make space uh, to host international makers. We're going to uh, make that space available throughout the year to local makers, uh, makers from other maker spaces, uh, one just open in Worcester, uh, actually two just open in Worcester, for example, and try to get some just cross-pollination and exchange and subsidize that so people can come and really settle in, have their space taken care of, and then teach, because that's really what we're all about is teaching and learning from each other um, in uh, that big, crazy space we have. So that's what we're working on now. You guys aren't busy at all. No. None of you. How about we get some questions from the audience? Dave? No? Matt, down in front. So earlier today we heard from business communities and starters, and they had very nice panel. We heard like Dave and Dan Sack and Tim and Sarah, and they're pretty much bringing up technical here in small business. Um, yeah. uh, and now um, we're hearing from you, and I'm, I'm curious about like the, the emotional process of the year. Like, as you continue to progress and you're looking towards those next steps and the future of your business, does that No, it doesn't go away, no. Um, for me, like, I think self-care, that's something I'm thinking a lot about, is how to manage that and um, being able to direct my attention towards, you know, what are the good things, because every day I can totally be bogged down in, oh my God, we need to send out payroll, oh my God, we're being audited, you know, we have annual audit, oh, there's so much, we have this new program, we don't have enough staff, we don't have enough volunteers, you know, you can, you can mire in that all, all the time. Oh, where are we gonna be? How are we gonna pay rent? You know, that, that hasn't gone away for us, even though we've been around and we're, we're sticking to it. Um, so I find like I have to take the time to step back and not be 24 seven every day and have some boundaries to then allow the wins, like celebration. It's almost like we don't do that enough. And that's something, you know, and congratulating other people on the team and thanking people and spending a lot of time on gratitude has really been important to try and sustain, you know, what is needed to do the work. Yeah, that's, that's the last thing you said is really cool. I, uh, w our situation, we now have a team of about 25 people that are like full-time, probably 20 or, or so people, and they're incredible. They've never been, like both the employees that we have had for a long time and the new ones have never been better, have never been working more cooperatively. For one of the first times in our history, we don't have any questions as to whether or not we can, um, we can sort of keep the place running without much direct input from the managers, which is very interesting. And that's related to spending a lot of time with um, the folks that are working with us. So we're not actually, we don't have any, now we're just getting into optional trouble. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a famous, not famous, but there's a very common saying at our, uh, at our business, and it actually came to me from a former colleague who, um, who had been in several tours of, of Iraq. And so it goes like this, when there are very stressful moments, and in production, 
you know, we have a huge order that has to go out and it has to go out because if you run out of product when you're in the market, you lose the accounts or they get upset. And so if the canning line breaks down or if something doesn't work out, it's all, you know, the, all the ups and downs and the, the roller coaster that exists. And we always say, you know, nobody is shooting at us. And it's a, it's a kind of a funny-ish thing to say, but it's a really sincere thing that I say to everybody to calm themselves down because you know what? We're making booze. You know, we're making cider. And life is only so, so long and it needs to get out. And we trust the fact that we're all working as hard as we can, as diligently as we can to get the stuff to go the way it's supposed to go, but the universe doesn't always agree. So it's actually a very calming mechanism that I think is important because any of us can get caught in the rabbit wheel of unbelievable, undying, unrelenting stress. And I think the answer is for me after four years of this business and having run another business for nine years before that, it never goes away. But I think that you know, with age, you have a little bit more perspective on it, but what the counter to perspective is the additional baggage that comes with being an adult, which means you have things. <laughs> so you have home or homes, you have cars or cars, you might have kids, you might have whatever, you have material possessions, which sometimes make the downside seem a little bit bigger. There's something nice about being youthful when you start out and you feel like the world is your oyster. And even if you fail, what is there to lose? My ugly papa son chair, you know? Uh, so I think, you know, sometimes uh, age can get in your way if you let it, but if you have the right perspective, and I, and I do like what you said a lot about gratitude, I think you're spot on. When you're doing things, it, you have to take time to celebrate the victories because there are always so many other things that you think you could be doing. My competitor is doing this, my product is doing, you know, whatever it is, you always want to aspire for more, but if you just take a moment to realize what you've done, it can add a lot of calming to, uh, to what you're doing. Those were awesome answers. Uh, I think one more question. Hey, Abby. Do you have and, a and you can feel free to use nobody is shooting at you because I think it's a really good one. That's a great, great perspective. Do you have a question? You wave. <sighs> Growing bus their businesses and making culture in, throughout Somerville. Um, We talk, yeah, permitting and zoning yeah. is a challenge. Um, so here we go. The, the team, how do you uh, ensure that it's collaborative and uh, in your We make sure that everyone knows what they do. We make sure that people know clearly what they do and also what they don't know, what they, what they don't do. And it makes it easier for them to ask each other for help. I've, ben, I'm, I'm really curious about that. Do you have a... This is this is no no zone. You're not touching this department or these projects. Constantly. Okay. Those are the most constant communications, besides gratitude-oriented communications. Telling people, I know you can do this. I don't want you to do it. Hmm. Do you want it real? Do you want guys want to answer those real? Qu his his question then. Okay. Go for it. Yeah, I'm nodding because actually, um, so we're, um, the way we're structured, we're a membership organization, so members have a stake in the organization, a vote, a vote depending on how long they've been there, and um, so actually over the past few months, you know, as conflicts arise and as um, the direction of the organization and the choices that people make and what we decide to work on, um, the, we had several meetings and what came out of that was having a sort of strategic vision process. Um, and so we're just starting. I mean, it's, I don't have any answers for what that looks like. And, you know, we're mostly volunteer and it's going to work that way. And, and I think the board, our board of directors needing their support um, and uh, really trying to 
get them to uh, do the work um, and enable members and um, apply their expertise because our members have have done this before you know the people on this committee are like yeah I did this where I worked here and oh I did this um, so leveraging that um, and um, because you know skull is my favorite uh, motto uh, skull the our local chopper gang they uh, reside in artisans asylum it's be the superhero version of yourself and I think that's really powerful and that's what has allowed that group to exist for 20 years and I, so I think it's really important to have um, not only for internally, you know, externally, yeah, brand, this is our brand uh, and value proposition to our customers, but really internally, the people who work there and the people who make it, um, that internal branding is, is super important, so. And I think that's, the skull motto is really compelling to me because it doesn't, it doesn't really lose anything, it's perfect. At Aeronaut, we, we don't have that at all. We rely on people to figure out what they like about their jobs and to pursue those things completely individualistically within their own domains. And I think we are, someday, we're gonna be the superhero version of ourselves and, and be able to express that. But we don't have that in any way, shape, or form at this time. People have an understanding of what Aeronaut is and they, and they execute on that. I was trying to bring up my cheat sheet because I frankly can't remember them all, but um, what we did about uh, a year ago or so when we, we I won't say we went through a rebranding, but we um, shifted to producing some part of our packaging in cans, and we had to rethink how we wanted it to look because there's a lot more real estate, it lays out differently and all that, and it gave us a moment to think about what we really wanted to express, and so it was like, you know, a whole internal search and how it would how it would present outward and so forth. And so it was bigger than graphics. It was more philosophical to the company. And we came up with, uh, I think there are 15 of these core kind of elements, which are currently on our website, which I was, that's what I was gonna try to bring up and cheat with. But they are, um, they're really fun. They're a little tongue in cheek, but they speak to kind of who we are as a company and you know, just, our, the aura that we feel and that goes into all of our products. And so like, you know, I can, I can remember s several of them, but like, you know, one, one, and each of our cans actually has one of these on there. And we actually have our manifesto, quote unquote, on our website. And so for example, for us, uh, one is that we believe you can actually taste sincerity. And so that actually is something that every time we're making a product, we kind of go back to these things. And we say, does this really taste sincere? Does it taste authentic? Or does it taste like somebody used an eyedropper to create something you know, that is going to simulate something? Or we believe everything worth drinking is worth drinking well. You know, so everything that we do, we want to make sure that it's not just an everyday thing that's actually special. So we have this quote unquote manifesto. But the point is so that we can ourselves always revert back to it to make sure that everything we're doing is kind of on that core set of messages. I, just really, I thought of something. I came up with a model for the Aeronaut Labs just now, which is cool. What do we got? I'm going to get experimental in nature. Think about that. It's pretty good. Yeah. So I, but we, we work with like a bunch of the brewers. It really helped us when we could come up with a model for their beer. And we came up with the consensus motto that was, we made beers that were hoppy, sour, or otherwise interesting. And that has stuck for the brewery. It's just harder for a big company. Yeah. But experimental nature, I think that's going to stick for the labs. Double meaning. Just came to me. Just came to me. Uh -oh. I like it. I like it. I'm not good at that kind of thing. Thanks, everyone. Um, where I ask everyone, where can you uh, can we find you guys that haven't been to your locations? What's the actual address to uh, visit Aeronaut, Bantam, and Artisans Asylum? We're 10 Tyler Street, and. Um, I will invite you all. We're having our first ever annual gala on October twenty second. Gala, 22nd. that is so fancy. Well, it's a masquerade. Okay. And so you'll be expected to come in your uh, best dress, and we'll actually teach you how to make some stuff to wear. Uh, so watch our class calendar for all of that this fall uh, to prepare. Fourteen Tyler Street, right next to Brooklyn Boulders, right next to Arden's Asylum. Across the square from Bantam. Lots of bikes around. <laughs> uh, we are two and a half minutes this way, because I just walked it. Uh, 40 Merriam Street, next to the famed Pizza Palace. Cool. Awesome.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chess.